So, as always, let us sit up straight, the spine erect, gaze uplifted. Let's bring our hands in front of our hearts and pray to our gurus, to God, Divine Mother, Heavenly Father, Friend, Beloved God, Great Masters of Kriya Yoga, Jesus Christ, Babaji Krishna, Lahiri Mahashaya, Swami Sri Yukteswar Ji, Beloved Gurudev, Paramhansa Yogananda Ji, saints and sages of all religions, dear friend and guide, Swami Kriyananda, humbly we bow at thy feet. O great ones, help us to tune into thy consciousness, thy bliss. Help us to love thee just as you have loved us. Help us to keep the spotlight of our consciousness, of our spiritual eye, of our attention, always focused on Thee. May we always tune into Thy guidance and live this life as You want us to. May we always live keeping in mind the highest principles of Kriya Yoga in every aspect of our life. Guide us, help us, bring us home. We are thine, be thou eternally ours. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. One chant. Closing our eyes, gazing up at the point between the eyebrows. Let's call on to our gurus. Especially today, Sri Yukteswar, Paramhansa Yogananda. Visualize them at the point between the eyebrows. Feel their presence. 
in our hearts, their love, their guidance. Tune into this beautiful guru-disciple relationship that they both shared. May they, they bless us also with this guidance and blessings always. Om Shanti Shanti. So uh, today we, I mean, this whole book uh, from the first line, the chapter one, where Master says that, I mean, it was completely about his seeking a guru, where he says that. This, um, you know, that this is a tra the beautiful tradition of India where a guru disciple relationship. So, the whole crux of this book was, you know, him looking for a guru and him meeting the guru, and then his years where he gets trained. And uh, Yogananda came, his dispensation was to take the ancient teachings of Kriya Yoga into the world. Uh, which for which Babaji and Jesus Christ, they are, they are uh, you know, kind of in tune with each other. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is the the ascending Dwapar Yoga. And that's the need that, you know, the this, this Kriya Yoga spreads even to the West, which is not very materialistic. And India has that spiritual quality. So, you know, the, both should merge. And for that, uh, Babaji had said that he will send a disciple who uh, Sri Yukteswar has to train. And the, I mean, the whole purpose of Sri Yukteswar's life was to train Yogananda, who can then take um, the, the teachings to the West and spread uh, across the world. And now, today, as uh, that, that life, that this incarnation that he had taken of this great avatar, Gyan avatar, as Master called him, is coming to an end. Very poignant, but... Uh, Again, a lot of learning for each one of us of what a guru-disciple relationship really means. Um, from their end, it is, it is equal to each one of us. For us, we need to tune in the way Yogananda had tuned into Sri Yukteswar. And uh, before we discuss this chapter further, let us listen to Swamiji reading out this chapter and then we will discuss it. Chapter 42 Last Days with My Guru Guruji, I'm glad to find you alone this morning. I had just arrived at the Serampur Hermitage, carrying a fragrant burden of fruit and roses. Siyukteshwa glanced at me meekly. What is your question? Master looked about the room as though he were seeking escape. Guruji, I came to you as a high school youth. Now I am a grown man, even with a grey hair or two. Though you have showered me with silent affection from the first hour to this, do you realize that once only on the day of meeting have you ever said, I love you? I looked at him pleadingly. Master lowered his gaze. Yogananda, must I bring out into the cold realms of speech? the warm sentiments best guarded by the wordless heart. Guruji, I know you love me, but my mortal ears ache to hear you say so. Be it as you wish. During my married life I often yearned for a son to train in the yogic path. But when you came into my life I was content. In you I have found my son. Two clear teardrops stood in Sri Yukteswar's eyes. Yogananda, I love you always. Your answer.
answer is my passport to heaven. I felt a weight lift from my heart, dissolved forever at his words. Often had I wondered at his silence, realizing that he was unemotional and self-contained. Yet sometimes I feared I had been unsuccessful in fully satisfying him. His was a strange nature, never utterly to be known, a nature deep and still, unfathomable to the outer world, whose values he had long transcended. A few days later, when I spoke before a huge audience at Albert Hall in Calcutta, Sri Yukteswar consented to sit beside me on the platform with the Maharaja of Santosh and the Mayor of Calcutta. Though Master made no remark to me, I glanced at him from time to time during my address and thought I detected a pleased twinkle in his eyes. Then came a talk before the alumni of Serampore College. As I gazed upon my old classmates and as they gazed on their own mad monk, tears of joy showed unashamedly. My silver-tongued professor of philosophy, Dr. Ghoshal, came forward to greet me, all our past misunderstandings dissolved by the alchemist time. A winter solstice festival was celebrated at the end of December in the Serampore Hermitage. As always, Sri Yukteswar's disciples gathered from far and near. Devotional Shankirtans, solos in the nectar-sweet voice of Kristoda, a feast served by young disciples, Master's profoundly moving discourse under the stars in the thronged courtyard of the ashram. Memories, memories, joyous festivals of years long past. Tonight, however, there was to be a new feature. Yogananda, please address the assemblage in English. Master's eyes were twinkling as he made this doubly unusual request. Was he thinking of the shipboard predicament that had preceded my first lecture in English? I told the story to my audience of brother disciples, ending with a fervent tribute to our guru. His omnipresent guidance was with me, not alone on the ocean steamer, I concluded, but daily throughout my fifteen years in the vast and hospitable land of America. After the guests had departed, Sri Yukteswar called me to the same bedroom where, once only, after a festival of my early years, I had been permitted to sleep on his wooden bed. Tonight my guru was sitting there quietly, a semicircle of disciples at his feet. He smiled as I quickly entered the room. Yogananda, are you leaving now for Calcutta? Please return here tomorrow. I have certain things to tell you. The next afternoon, with a few simple words of blessing, Sri Yukteswar bestowed on me the further monastic title of Paramhamsa. It now formally supersedes your former title of Swami, he said as I knelt before him. With a silent chuckle, I thought of the struggle which my American students would undergo over the pronunciation of Paramahansaji. My task on earth is now finished. You must carry on. Master spoke quietly, his eyes calm and gentle. My heart was palpitating in fear. Please send someone to take charge of our ashram at Puri, Sri Yukteswar went on. I leave everything in your hands. You will be able to successfully sail the boat of your life and that of the organization to the divine shores. In tears I was embracing his feet. He rose and blessed me endearingly. The following day I summoned from Ranchi a disciple, Swami Sevananda, and sent him to Puri to assume the hermitage duties. Later my guru discussed with me the legal details of settling his estate. He was anxious to prevent the possibility of litigation 
by relatives after his death for possession of his two hermitages and other properties which he wished to be deeded over solely for charitable purposes. Arrangements were recently made for Master to visit Kidarpur, but he failed to go. A Mulaya Babu, a brother disciple, made this remark to me one afternoon. I felt a cold wave of premonition. To my pressing inquiries, Sri Yukteswar only replied, I go to Kidarpur no more. For a moment Master trembled like a frightened child. Parenthesis, attachment to bodily residence, springing up of its own nature, in other words, arising from immemorial roots, past experiences of death, wrote Patanjali, is present in slight degree even in great saints. In some of his discourses on death, my guru had been wont to add, just as a long-caged bird hesitates to leave its accustomed home when the door is opened. Guruji, I entreated him with a sob, don't say that, never utter those words to me. Sri Yukteswar's face relaxed in a peaceful smile. Though nearing his 81st birthday, he looked well and strong. Basking day by day in the sunshine of my guru's love, unspoken but keenly felt. I banished from my conscious mind the various hints he had given of his approaching passing. Sir, the Kumbha Mela is convening this month at Allahabad. I showed Master the Mela dates in a Bengali almanac. Do you really want to go? Not sensing Sir Yukteswar's reluctance to help me leave him, I went on, once you beheld the blessed sight of Babaji at an Allahabad Kumbha. Perhaps this time I shall be fortunate enough to see him. I do not think you will meet him there. My guru then fell into silence, not wishing to obstruct my plans. When I set out for Allahabad the following day with a small group, Master blessed me quietly in his usual manner. Apparently I was remaining oblivious to implications in Sri Yukteswar's attitude because the Lord wished to spare me the experience of being forced helplessly to witness my guru's passing. It has always happened in my life that at the death of those dearly beloved by me, God has compassionately arranged that I be distant from the scene. Our party reached the Kumbha Mela on January 23, 1936. The surging crowd of nearly two million persons was an impressive sight, even an overwhelming one. The particular genius of the Indian people is the reverence innate in even the lowliest peasant for the worth of the spirit, and for the monks and sadhus who have forsaken worldly ties to seek a diviner anchorage. Impostors and hypocrites there are indeed, but India respects all for the sake of the few who illumine the whole land with supernal blessings. Westerners who were viewing the vast spectacle had a unique opportunity to feel the pulse of the land, the spiritual ardor to which India owes her quenchless vitality before the blows of time. The first day was spent by our group in sheer staring. Here were countless bathers dipping in the holy river for remission of sins. There we saw solemn rituals of worship. Yonder were devotional offerings being strewn at the dusty feet of saints. A turn of our heads and a line of elephants, caparisoned horses, and slow-paced Rajputana camels filed by, or a quaint religious parade of naked sadhus waving scepters of gold and silver, or flags and streamers of silk and velvet. Anchorites wearing only loincloths sat quietly in little groups, their bodies besmeared with the ashes that protect them from the heat and cold. The spiritual eye was vividly represented in their foreheads by a single spot of sandalwood paste. Shaven-headed swamis appeared by the thousands 
ochre-robed and carrying their bamboo staff and begging bowl. Their faces beamed with their enunciate's peace as they walked about or held philosophical discussions with disciples. Here and there under the trees, around huge piles of burning logs, were picturesque sadhus, their hair braided and massed in coils on top of their heads. Some wore beards several feet in length, curled and tied in a knot. They meditated quietly, or extended their hands in blessing to the passing throng. Beggars, maharajas on elephants, women in multicolored saris, their bangles and anklets tinkling, fakirs with thin arms held grotesquely aloft, brahmacharis carrying meditation elbow props, humble sages whose solemnity hid an inner bliss. High above the din we heard the ceaseless summons of the temple bells. On our second Mela day, my companions and I entered various ashrams and temporary huts offering pranams to saintly personages. We received the blessings of the leader of the giri branch of the Swami order, a thin ascetical monk with eyes of smiling fire. Our next visit took us to a hermitage whose guru had observed for the past nine years the vows of silence and a strict fruitarian diet. On the central dais in the ashram hall sat a blind sadhu, Braklash Chakshu, profoundly learned in the Shastras and highly revered by all sects. After I had given a brief discourse in Hindi on Vedanta, our group left the peaceful hermitage to greet a nearby Swami, Krishnananda, a handsome monk with rosy cheeks and impressive shoulders. Reclining near him was a tame lioness. Succumbing to the monk's spiritual charm, not, I am sure, to his powerful physique, the jungle animal refuses all meat in favor of rice and milk. The Swami has taught the tawny-haired beast to utter Om in a deep, attractive growl, a cat devotee. Our next encounter, an interview with a learned young sadhu, is well described in Mr. Wright's sparkling travel diary. Quote, we rode in the ford across the very low Ganges on a creaking pontoon bridge, crawling snake-like through the crowds and over narrow, twisting lanes, passing the site on the river bank which Yoganandaji pointed out to me as the meeting place of Babaji and Sri Yukteswar. Alighting from the car a short time later, we walked some distance through the thickening smoke of the sadhu's fires and over the slippery sands to reach a cluster of tiny very modest mud and straw huts. We halted in front of one of these insignificant temporary dwellings, with a pygmy doorless entrance, the shelter of Karapatri, a young wandering sadhu, noted for his exceptional intelligence. There he sat cross-legged on a pile of straw, his only covering, and, incidentally, his only possession, being an ochre cloth draped over his shoulders. Truly a divine face smiled at us after we had crawled on all fours into the hut and pranamed at the feet of this enlightened soul, while the kerosene lantern at the entrance flickered weird, dancing shadows on the thatched walls. His face, especially his eyes and perfect teeth, gleamed and glistened. Although I was puzzled by the Hindi, his expressions were very revealing. He was full of enthusiasm, love, spiritual glory. No one could be mistaken as to his greatness. Imagine the happy life of one unattached to the material world, free of the clothing problem, free of food craving, never begging, never touching cooked food, except on alternate days never carrying a begging bowl, free of all money entanglements, 
never handling money, never storing things away, always trusting in God, free of transportation worries, never riding in vehicles, but always walking on the banks of the sacred rivers, never remaining in one place longer than a week, in order to avoid any growth of attachment. Such a modest soul, unusually learned in the Vedas, and possessing an M.A. degree and the title of Shastri, Master of Scriptures from Benares University. A sublime feeling pervaded me as I sat at his feet. It all seemed to be an answer to my desire to see the real, the ancient India, for he is a true representative of this land of spiritual giants." End quote. I questioned Karapatri about his wandering life. Don't you have any extra clothes for winter? No, this is enough. Do you carry any books? No, I teach from memory those people who wish to hear me. What else do you do? I roam by the Ganges. At these quiet words I was overpowered by a yearning for the simplicity of his life. I remembered America and all the responsibilities that lay on my shoulders. No, Yogananda, I thought sadly for a moment, in this life roaming by the Ganges is not for you. After the sadhu had told me a few of his spiritual realizations, I shot an abrupt question. Are you giving these descriptions from scriptural lore or from inner experience? Half from book learning, he answered with a straightforward smile, and half from experience. We sat happily a while in meditative silence. After we had left his sacred presence, I said to Mr. Wright, he is a king sitting on a throne of golden straw. We had our dinner that night on the Mela grounds under the stars, eating from leaf plates pinned together with sticks. Dish washings in India are reduced to a minimum. Two more days of the fascinating Kumbha, then northwest along the Jamuna banks to Agra. Once again I gazed at the Taj Mahal. In memory, Jitendra stood by my side, awed by the dream in marble. Then on to the Brindaban ashram of Swami Keshavananda. My object in seeking out Keshavananda was connected with this book. I had never forgotten Sri Yukteswar's request that I write the life of Lahiri Mohashai. During my stay in India, I was taking every opportunity of contacting direct disciples and relatives of the Yogavatar. Recording their conversations in voluminous notes, I verified facts and dates and collected photographs, old letters and documents. My Lahiri Mohajai portfolio began to swell. I realized with dismay that ahead of me lay arduous labors in authorship. I prayed that I might be equal to my role as biographer of the colossal guru. Several of his disciples feared that in a written account their master might be belittled or misinterpreted. One can hardly do justice in cold words to the life of a divine incarnation Pantanon Bhattacharya had once remarked to me. Other close disciples were similarly satisfied to keep the Yogavatar hidden in their hearts as the deathless preceptor. Nevertheless, mindful of Lahiri Mahashai's prediction about his biography, I spared no effort to secure and substantiate the facts of his outward life. Swami Keshavananda greeted our party warmly at Brindaban in his Katayani Pit ashram, an imposing brick building with massive black pillars set in a beautiful garden. He ushered us at once into a sitting room adorned with an enlargement of Lahiri Mahashai's picture. The Swami was approaching the age of ninety, but his muscular body radiated strength and health. With long hair and a snow-white beard, eyes twinkling with joy, he was a veritable patriarchal embodiment. 
I informed him that I wanted to mention his name in my book on India's masters. Please tell me about your earlier life, I smiled entreatingly. Great yogis are often uncommunicative. Keshapananda made a gesture of humility. There is little of external moment. Practically my whole life has been spent in the Himalayan solitudes, traveling on foot from one quiet cave to another. For a while I maintained a small ashram outside Hardwar, surrounded on all sides by a grove of tall trees. It was a peaceful spot, little visited by travelers, owing to the ubiquitous presence of cobras. Keshavananda chuckled. Later a Ganges flood washed away the hermitage and cobras alike. My disciples then helped me to build this Brindavan ashram. One of our party asked the Swami how he had protected himself against the Himalayan tigers. Keshavananda shook his head. In those high spiritual altitudes, he said, wild beasts seldom molest the yogis. Once in the jungle, I encountered a tiger face to face. At my sudden ejaculation, the animal was transfixed as though turned to stone. Again, the Swami chuckled at his memories. Occasionally, I left my seclusion to visit my guru in Benares. He used to joke with me over my ceaseless travels in the Himalayan wilderness. You have the mark of wanderlust on your foot, he told me once. I am glad that the sacred Himalayas are extensive enough to engross you. Many times Keshavananda went on, both before and after his passing. Lahiri Mohashai has appeared bodily before me. For him, no Himalayan height is inaccessible. Two hours later, he led us to a dining patio. I sighed in silent dismay. Another fifteen-course meal. Less than a year of Indian hospitality, and I had gained fifty pounds. Yet it would have been considered the height of rudeness to refuse any of the dishes carefully prepared for the endless banquets in my honor. In India, nowhere else, alas, a well-padded swami is considered a delightful sight. After dinner, Keshavananda led me to a secluded nook. Your arrival is not unexpected, he said. I have a message for you. I was surprised. No one had known of my plan to visit Keshavananda. While roaming last year in the northern Himalayas near Badrinarayan, the Swami continued, I lost my way. Shelter appeared in a spacious cave which was empty, though the embers of a fire glowed in a hole in the rocky floor. Wondering about the occupant of this lonely retreat, I sat near the fire, my gaze fixed on the sunlit entrance to the cave. Keshavananda, I am glad you are here. These words came from behind me. I turned, startled, and was dazzled to behold Babaji. The great guru had materialized himself in a recess of the cave. Overjoyed to see him again after many years, I prostrated myself at his holy feet. I called you here, Babaji went on. That is why you lost your way and were led to my temporary abode in this cave. It is a long time since our last meeting. I am pleased to greet you once more. The deathless master blessed me with some words of spiritual help. Then added, I give you a message for Yogananda. He will pay you a visit on his return to India. Many matters connected with his guru and with the surviving disciples of Lahiri will keep Yogananda fully occupied. Tell him, then, that I won't see him this time, as he is eagerly hoping, but I shall see him on some other occasion. I was deeply touched to receive from Keshavananda's lips this consoling promise from Babaji. A certain hurt 
in my heart vanished. I grieved no longer that, even as Ryukteswar had hinted, Babaji did not appear at the Kumbh Mela. Spending one night as guests of the ashram, our party set out the following afternoon for Calcutta. Riding over a bridge of the Jamuna River, we enjoyed a magnificent view of the skyline of Vrindavan, just as the sun set fire to the sky, a veritable furnace of Vulcan in color. Reflected below in the still waters, the Jamuna beach is hallowed by memories of the child Sri Krishna. Here he engaged with innocent sweetness in his leelas, plays with the gopis or maids. Exemplifying the supernal love which ever exists between a divine incarnation and his devotees, the life of Lord Krishna has been misunderstood by many Western commentators. Scriptural allegory is baffling to literal minds. A hilarious blunder by a translator will illustrate this point. The story concerns an inspired medieval saint, the cobbler Ravidas, who sang in the simple terms of his own trade of the spiritual glory hidden in all mankind. Quote, Under the vast vault of blue lives the divinity clothed in hide. End quote. One turns aside to hide a smile on hearing the pedestrian interpretation given to Ravidas's poem by a Western writer. He afterwards built a hut, set up in it an idol, which he made from hide, and applied himself to its worship. <laughs> Ravidas was a brother disciple of the great Kabir. One of Ravidas's exalted chelas was the Rani of Chitor. She invited a large number of Brahmins to a feast in honor of her teacher, but they refused to eat with a lowly cobbler. As they sat down in dignified aloofness, to eat their uncontaminated meal. Lo, each Brahmin found at his side the form of Ravidas. This mass vision accomplished a widespread spiritual revival in Chitor. In a few days our little group reached Calcutta. Eager to see Sri Yukteswar, I was disappointed to hear that he had left Serampore and was now in Puri. Come to Puri Ashram at once. This telegram was sent on March 8th by my brother disciple to Atul Chandra Roy Chaudhary, one of Master's Chelas in Calcutta. News of the message reached my ears, anguished at its implications. I dropped to my knees and implored God that my Guru's life be spared. As I was about to leave Father's home for the train, a divine voice spoke within. Do not go to Puri tonight. Thy prayer cannot be granted. Lord, I said, grief-stricken, thou dost not wish to engage me in a tug of war at Puri, where thou wilt have to deny my incessant prayers for Master's life. Must he then depart for higher duties at thy behest? In obedience to the inward command, I did not leave that night for Puri. The following evening, I set out for the train. On the way, at seven o'clock, a black astral cloud suddenly covered the sky. Later, while the train roared toward Puri, a vision of Sri Yukteswar appeared before me. He was sitting, very grave of countenance, with a light on each side. Is it all over? I lifted my arms beseechingly. He nodded, then slowly vanished. As I stood on the Puri train platform the following morning, still hoping against hope, an unknown man approached me. Have you heard that your master is gone? He left me without another word. I never discovered who he was, nor how he had known where to find me. Stunned, I swayed against the platform wall, realizing that in diverse ways my guru was trying to convey to me the devastating news. Seething with rebellion, my soul was like a volcano, 
By the time I reached the Pori Hermitage, I was nearing collapse. The inner voice was tenderly repeating, Collect yourself, be calm. I entered the ashram room where Master's body, unimaginably lifelike, was sitting in the lotus posture, a picture of health and loveliness. A short time before his passing, my guru had been slightly ill with fever, but before the day of his ascension into the infinite, his body had become completely well. No matter how often I looked at his dear form, I could not realize that its life had departed. His skin was smooth and soft. In his face was a beatific expression of tranquility. He had consciously relinquished his body at the hour of mystic summoning. The Lion of Bengal is gone, I cried in a daze. I conducted the solemn rites on March 10th, Sri Yukteswa was buried with the ancient rituals of the Swamis in the garden of his Puri ashram. His disciples later arrived from far and near to honor their guru at a vernal equinox memorial service. The Amrita Bazar Patrika, leading newspaper of Calcutta, carried his picture and the following report. Quote, the death Bandara ceremony for Srimat Swami Sri Yukteswar Giri Maharaj, aged 81, took place at Puri on March 21st. Many disciples came down to Puri for the rites. One of the great expounders of the Bhagavad Gita, Swamiji Maharaj was a great disciple of Yogi Raj Sri Shama Charan Lahiri Mohashai of Benares. Swami Maharaj was the founder of several Yogoda Satsanga, or Self-Realization Fellowship, centers in India, and was the great inspiration behind the yoga movement, which was carried to the West by Swami Yogananda, his principal disciple. It was Sri Yukteswarji's prophetic powers and deep realization that inspired Swami Yogananda to cross the oceans and spread in America the message of the Masters of India. His interpretations of the Bhagavad Gita and other scriptures testify to the depth of Sri Yukteswarji's command of the philosophy both Eastern and Western, and remain as an eye-opener for the unity between Orient and Occident. As he believed in the unity of all religious faiths, Sri Yukteswar Maharaj established Sadhu Shabha, Society of Saints, with the cooperation of leaders of various sects and faiths for the inculcation of a scientific spirit in religion. At the time of his demise, he nominated Swami Yogananda, his successor, as the president of Shadu Shabha. India is really poorer today by the passing of such a great man. May all fortunate enough to have come near him inculcate in themselves the true spirit of India's culture and sadhana, which was personified in him. End quote. I returned to Calcutta, not trusting myself as yet to go to the Serampore Hermitage with its sacred memories. I summoned Prafula, Sayukteshwar's little disciple in Serampore, and made arrangements for him to enter the Ranchi school. The morning you left for the Allahabad Mela, Prafula told me, Master dropped heavily on the Davenport. Yogananda is gone, he cried. Yogananda is gone. He added cryptically, I shall have to tell him some other way. He sat then for hours in silence. My days were filled with lectures, classes, interviews, and reunions with old friends. Beneath a hollow smile and a life of ceaseless activity, a stream of black brooding polluted the inner river of bliss, which for so many years had meandered under the sands of all my perceptions. Where has that divine sage gone? I cried silently from the depths of a tormented spirit. No answer came. It is best that Master has completed his union with the Cosmic Beloved, 
my mind assured me. He is eternally glowing in the dominion of deathlessness. Never again may you see him. In the old Serampur mansion, my heart lamented. No longer may you bring your friends to meet him, or proudly say, Behold, there sits India's Gyanavatar. Mr. Wright made arrangements for our party to sail from Bombay for the West early in June. After a fortnight in May of farewell banquets and speeches in Calcutta, Miss Bletch, Mr. Wright, and myself left in the ford for Bombay. On our arrival, the ship authorities asked us to cancel our passage, as no room could be found for the ford, which we would need again in Europe. Never mind, I said gloomily to Mr. Wright. I want to return once more to Puri. I silently added, let my tears once again water the grave of Continue closing your eyes, gazing up at the point between the eyebrows. I will read this poem that Master had written in honor of his guru. This is mentioned in the Whispers from Eternity. It says, My Guru, Thou light of my life, Thou camest to spread wisdom's glow over the path of my soul. Centuries of darkness dissolved before the shafts of thy luminous health. As a naughty baby, I cried for my mother divine, and she came to me as my guru, Swami Sri Yukteswar. At that meeting, O oh my guru, a spark flew from thee, and the faggots of my God craving gathered through incarnations, smouldered and blazed into bliss. All my questions have been answered with thy flaming golden touch. Eternal, ever-present satisfaction has come to me through thy glory. My Guru, thou voice of God, I found thee in response to my soul cries. Slumbers of sorrow are gone and I am awake in bliss. If all the gods are displeased, yet thou art pleased. I am safe in the fortress of thy pleasure. And if all the gods protect me behind the parapets of their blessings, yet I receive not thy benedictions, I am an orphan, left to pine spiritually in the ruins of thy displeasure. O Guru, thou didst bring me out of the bottomless pit of darkness into the paradise of peace. Our souls met after years of waiting. They trembled with an omnipresent thrill. We met here because we had met before. Together, we will fly to his shores where we will smash our planes of finitude forever and vanish into infinite life. I bow to thee as the spoken voice of silent God. I bow to thee as the divine door which leads to the temple of salvation, I bow to thee, to thy master, Lahiri Mahashaya, harbinger of yoga in Banaras, and I lay the flowers of my devotion at the feet of Babaji, our supreme master. Just for a moment, tune into Sri Yukteswar. The Jnana Vatar. Oh. So 
there is actually not much to discuss in this chapter. I mean, it doesn't feel right to discuss even after this beautiful chapter. Okay, so uh, we'll still go about it. The first chapter where he goes and tells his guru. I mean, the moment he goes and he says, I'm glad to find you alone. Sri Yukteswar knows why he is here. And he says, Sri Yukteswar glanced at me meekly. I mean, it's difficult to think of Sri Yukteswar looking at anyone meekly. And the next he says, what is your question? And he looked about the room as though he's seeking escape because he knew why this uh, his disciple, his favorite disciple has come and what is he going to demand of him. And it's so it's so beautiful. Shri, I mean, Paramansa Yogananda is a, is a self-realized master. He is one with the infinite. He is an avatar. Yet, you know, he shows that human uh, quality where he says just once, Say, I love you to me. So beautiful. And uh, Swami Kriyananda once, I think we had discussed this in a previous class also, where Swami Kriyananda said uh, that, you know, uh, Master and Sri Yukteswar were soulmates. So for us, you know, when we say soulmates, we always think of it in a, the romantic soulmates, right? But soulmates is, is much beyond that, where two souls belong with each other. So. Uh, and uh, Sri Yukteswar and, and one soul, that both the souls complete each other. That is what the main uh, thing. And if you remember very uh, in the first meeting itself, Sri Yukteswar says, I, I love you, you know, unconditionally. And he also says, I mean, that is when we, uh, uh, if it, uh, something to think about that here Mukunda has met his guru, uh, and wants to be his disciple. And the guru says, if ever uh, you find me falling from those heights of spirituality, bring me back, gently back on the path. Which is like, you know, very difficult to believe. How, I mean, Sri Yukteswar is a self-realized master. Why is he saying this? It's because, I mean, it, Mukunda, I mean, uh, Yogananda was playing a role. It is a leela. He, he was a self-realized master even as he was born. I mean, and uh, Swami Kriyananda said that long time back, he is told uh, when the monks were sitting with him that I killed Yogananda long ago. No one dwells in this body but God, which means that even as he came into this uh, that lifetime for that particular role, he came as a self-realized master. And all this was a leela for for us to read and understand what this is all about, right? So here we are where uh, he says, please say that to me. And uh, how beautiful, like, you know, uh, Sri Yukteswar says, during my married life, I often yearn for a son. Again, uh, a self-realized master who is supposed to not have any desire, but he had this tiny desire and uh, for a son, but again, not for, you know, just having a son because, uh, or more, I want to pass on all my material uh, wealth to him, but to train on the yogic path. And uh, as you know, God fulfills all desires, right? Every desire is fulfilled. Even this tiny desire uh, which Sri Yukteswar had was fulfilled, but in a much more uh, expansive way where he had a spiritual son. Uh, not just uh, you know a biological son, but a spiritual son who was able to receive all that he had to give, and you know became a paramansa, uh, a self-realized master in his own rights. So uh, as I said, that you know if it is a very uh, expansive and uh, spiritually uplifting desire, then uh, even that I mean a small desire and that is why it's, they say that you know you be very careful what you ask for because uh, when it gets fulfilled you might not really like it uh, because our uh, desires are all wants wants that come from our egos whereas for them it is like you know much more expansive that they have so and so beautifully he says that you came to my life i was content in you i have found my son 
and two teardrops stood in his eyes. So beautiful, even to visualize that, that scene. And for master also, such a human way when he says your answer is my passport. I mean, it was there was some something that was there in his heart that he wanted to hear it again. And he gets it. Okay. So here, um, where he is giving lecture, and so sweetly, though master made no remark to me, I glanced at him from time to time. So there was, you know, so even though he is a guru in himself, there are so, so many of his disciples, but there is again that Mukunda in him, when he looks at him again and again, when he is giving a lecture and he's looking for approval, and he says that I detected a, and again, he says, I thought I detected a pleased twinkle in his eyes. He thought. He didn't presume on it. Um, the, that is the most, uh, again, an important thing for each one of us. You know, even in our meditation, sometimes we are asking a question and we say, oh, master answered me. So it's a good point to, you know, pause. Is it really coming from, is this really what my guru is telling me? Or is it my, uh, you know, assumptions that I'm making? Because even master here is not presuming. He says, from, I looked at him from time to time and thought, I thought I detected a pleased twinkle in his eyes. Okay, and here um, that story, as we all know, where he says that, you know, why don't you talk to the assemblage in English? And he talks about that first, if all of us remember, that first trip that, that ship uh, he had taken to go to America, he was still not very good in English. And uh, somebody asked him to come and give a lecture. And he went and stood there. He says, the 10 minutes, nothing came out. And then he prayed, help me, help me. And in, he heard internally that, you know, Yoga, Yogananda, speak, you can do this. And uh, he gave for, I think, half an hour he spoke. And he says that, I, did, I don't remember what I said. I asked somebody and they said, oh, it was very inspiring. And he says, it couldn't have been possible if, my guru had not helped him. And that is what he's talking about, right? Now, uh, that, that, uh, that thing. And he, 15 years, he says, what gratitude. He says, his omnipresent guidance was with me, not alone on the ocean steamer, but daily throughout my 15 years in the vast and hospitable land. So much gratitude. Even though he was a guru, he was a self-realized master and uh, Yet, you know, he never let that go, that gratitude of a disciple for his guru, that it was his guru who is guiding uh, him on this path. And here he gets his title of Paramhansa. There's a little footnote here, which means, which says that literally Param, highest, Hansa, swam. The Hansa is represented in scriptural lore as the vehicle of Brahma, Supreme Spirit, as a symbol of discrimination, the white Hansa is thought as able to separate the true Soma nectar from a mixture of milk and water. Hansa, pronounced Hong Sa, are two sacred Sanskrit chant words possessing a vibratory connection with the incoming and outgoing breath, Aham Saha, which is literally, I am He. And that is what we learn when we come first on this path, right? Okay. Now, uh, here, you know, uh, Sri Yukteswar, even when he was, uh, master was in America and his meditation, he heard that, you know, my time is ending now. Come. Again, he's saying, my task on earth is finished. So he is clearly telling him, I'm going, I'm leaving. So, uh, and master every time says, my heart was palpitating and he was also realizing it is end ending. And um, so, uh, Time and again, time and again, it is being told to him. Yet, he says, Sir, the Kumbh Mela is convening this month in Allahabad. And again, he's saying, do you really want to go? Master says, I will go. And that's the beauty of uh, this. You know, the Guru gives us the free will. They will not say it. He, he could have said, even if, if Sri Yukteswar had said, please don't go. Master wouldn't have gone if his Guru had told him that. He gave him the free will. He just asked him, do you really want to go? And, you know, master just said, and sometimes, you know, you wonder, I mean, 
master didn't know of course he knew and shri yukteswar was giving him i mean the very fact that he came to india was because shri yukteswar said in his meditation that you know i'm going and again he said in this the previous page he said that you know my time is short yet master is going so he says that you know it has always happened in my life that at the death of those dearly beloved to me god has compassionately arranged that i be distant from the scene so here this is something very important for us to understand the self realized masters they are not doing something because they want to do the ego is telling so he, he is so interested in going to kumbh mela because he wants to see because you know he wants to see baba ji they do it because the divine is directing them to do so uh, uh, he has he's written here right no but i was not present at the death of my mother elder brother ananta elder sister roma master father or of several close disciples in fact his very close disciple sister gyan mata um it she came on the path when she was 60 and you know for next 20 years it said that master kept her in the body she was suffering a lot physically but master had made a deal with god that he will not take her away till master allows it to so he allowed her to suffer because he wanted her to finish off all her karma and be jeevan mukta and the day when you know she was about to leave that moment when she was about to leave he told the other uh, you know uh, disciple to take him out on a drive in the car they were driving about he knew she was going to leave but he left he says that because you know when he loves these people so much and he had the power that if you know they when they are going i mean again he's showing that human quality where that out of love he would try to hold them back and he says i can argue with god and i can hold them back and he the god will divine will not be able to refuse i mean he had that power that if he says no don't take them divine will not take but again he will not interfere with god's plan that is self realized master right if we are in that position we will think oh if only i had that power i could have done this but they wouldn't for their you know uh, uh, ego they will not do it to satisfy their ego or their attachment to something they would do what is right and that is a reason it was kind of you know blanked out uh, the fact that shri yukteswar is going and he left despite all the indications that were constantly he was receiving he set out uh, and you know then that all the description about the uh, kumbh mela we can skip all that and uh, keshava nanda um, that that temple is still there the katyayini temple when we had gone last few years back we stood on the same steps where master would have there's the picture here in that page no page number 392 the steps on which they are all standing so we stood there thinking that you know this is where master stood this place, it's wonderful to go to these places okay so here we are where keshavananda gives him the message and uh, again you know uh, it's 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 strange that baba ji master again is a spirit, uh, self realized master and he could he could directly i mean baba ji came to him when he said give me an answer should i go to america and baba ji walked into the door and told him yes you should go and here he is sending the message through someone because you know again these are all plays and this, they, they'll dramatize it to some extent and uh, deathless pastor blessed me i mean so he used keshavananda to pass this message to him saying that i'm not going to meet you this time uh i shall see him on some other occasion uh again and he tells keshavananda you you were lost because, you lost your way because i will did so lahiri mahashaya was uh, sent to uh, rani khet by mistake from the office because baba ji will did so more we live in attunement with our guru the more we uh, you know uh, keep asking what do you want me to do how do i live this life and if you know we want certain things in our life and uh, which doesn't seem to be happening the way we will it to and you know whatever trials we do and something keeps blocking it take it as the will of god of our guru 
So as the, uh, the master, the deathless master says that, tell him then that I won't see him this time, but I shall see him some other time. Accept this. I know if, if Keshavananda lost his way, it's because Babaji willed it. So the more we live with that, whatever is happening to our life, in our life, good, bad, not so good, not so bad, the more we accept it as coming from my guru. One, it is easy to accept anything that's happening in our life, knowing that my master has, is, is in charge. He knows what he's doing. So uh, this is a very, very, very helpful uh, attitude to lead our uh, spiritual life. Now that we are all disciples of this great lineage. And once we have said, when, when we take our discipleship, wow, it is, we say that, you know, we hand over uh, the charge. That's when she, she when first time Mukunda went to Sri Yukteswar and uh, he said, do you give me your unconditional obedience and your unconditional love? And when Mukunda said yes, Sri Yukteswar said yes. Okay, now I take charge of your life. And we have taken our discipleship vow. The Guru takes charge of our life. But, you know, our ego keeps interfering with that. Why did he do this? Why did that not? Why didn't he? Because this is how it is supposed to be. The more we start accepting it, if it didn't happen the way I wanted, but happened some other way, it's because my Guru is in charge and this is the right thing that has happened to us i think this is a very good takeaway for each one of us to practice also in every aspect every aspect of our lives every day of our life okay and he says a certain hurt in my heart vanished i grieved no longer that even as Sri Yukteswar had hinted, Babaji did not appear. So things didn't happen the way we want. Guru has not come. My meditation has not been too good. Uh, my Guru has willed it that way. So, you know, we can put any situation in that and say that this is how my Guru wanted it. But uh, as I said, the more we, we, we keep... Checking out. I mean, that is what we say then. No? Attunement is about practicing the presence of God and Gurus. So keep checking back. So here we are. Again, uh, he comes back and the message is there. Come to Puri Ashram at once. And he is about to leave. Again, the divine is saying, do not go to Puri tonight. Thy prayer cannot be granted. He is arguing with the, with the Lord. Uh, do we, does he really have to go? But then he says, in obedience to the inward command, I did not leave that night. If he had left, he could have met Sri Yukteswar in body before he left the body. But divine said, no, he didn't go. Throughout, I mean, you know, this is again another aspect that all of us need to learn that, you know, keep tuning in. What, what is my guru wanting me to do? What, what should I do in this situation? And, but most of the time, even if we are getting some suggestion, we would still ignore it and, you know, because I want to go and meet him. I know he's going to go away, so I might as well go and at least I'll get to meet uh, Sri Yukteswar. He didn't do that, even though, you know, that was a better way of doing it. If we look at it, Are, chale gaya hota to achha hota na. he could have met him. That is our thinking. But no, he didn't go because the divine said, don't go. Because as I said, he had the power to stop what was supposed to happen. So the divine said, please don't come there. He didn't go. He stayed, wait, stayed, stayed there. And, and he says, the following evening, I set out for the train on the way at 7 o'clock. Footnote says, Sri Yukteswar passed at this hour, 7 p.m., March 9th, 1936. Exactly at 7 o'clock, a black asteroid cloud suddenly covered the sky. And he sees his guru and he says, is it all over? And he nodded and vanished. And then the whole thing, uh, that carries on again you know uh, again this is a, such a beautiful thing when Prafulla comes and says that um, Yogananda left Sri Yukteswar didn't stop him from going to Kumbh Mela and then but he sat down and lamented that Yogananda is gone that is the kind of love that is the kind of connect these soulmates had that uh, the, the guru and disciple had for each each other they were I mean it is not like you know they are they are this infinite consciousness 
they are not they are not displaying the human uh, love also they they that is why swami uh, kriyananda said that you know it's much more easier for you all you never met um, uh, yogananda because for us who were living with him it was very difficult that here he is cosmic consciousness himself and yet he is sitting next to me eating food you know uh, it was difficult to bring both of that together because he was as human as any one of us and yet he was cosmic consciousness so he said for you guys it is much easier because you only link you know link him with that cosmic consciousness so here also like you know shri yukteswar was cosmic consciousness yet he displayed those human love that human uh, you know lamenting that oh my god uh, yogananda has gone such a beautiful thing i shall have to tell him some other way he had been giving hints he has been directly saying and he says he still left i shall have to tell him some other way and again after he is passed master says a streak of black brooding polluted the inner river of bliss so this self realized master there is always whatever activity he is doing there is always this inner river of bliss that he can, there is that is there flowing within him but there was this black brooding so he is like kind of showing it's okay to grieve when sister gyan mata passed passed away master cried at her funeral so he is showing that it's okay to grieve it's okay to show human emotions human love it's okay we don't have to no now i'm a lot of people have that we are on spiritual path we shouldn't be you know show, doing all this we shouldn't be feeling that way uh, we should be detached we should be all you know there's no non attachment he's showing that your shri yukteswar is showing that that love for his this thing is displaying that similarly he's saying that that black brooding polluted the inner river it's okay it's okay to grieve that's what he's showing us the whole point is then you know what are we doing to rise above it so there's nothing wrong to give it that space so and then you know uh, the next uh, chapter is even more beautiful where uh, there's a, we see the resurrection of shri yukteswar where he meets him again so with that any any thoughts that anybody wants to share or we can close today's i will also send a video in the group uh, autobiography of a yogi guru of uh, shri yukteswar's passing and master you know they all bury him again uh, saints are buried as he says that they are not cremated once they were they are double born no born again or twice born so when they take that vow of this thing they are supposed to be you know the cremating your physical existence so that's interesting so we can close today's session with that thank you for joining see you. see you next week thank you thank you very much